September 23rd, 1889. The Dakotas, Montana, and Washington wouldn't officially be states until later that year. London was trying to find Jack the Ripper, and Edison's team was working out motion pictures. But in Kyoto, Japan, Fusajiro Yamauchi had begun manufacturing playing cards, setting in motion the company that would one day dream up Game Boys, Super Nintendos, Luigi, Mario, and Princess Peach. And what we're executing is completely different from what they're doing. There's never a time when they're going to be in the building more than five minutes. I got it! I got the Wii! I got it! Nintendo is part of an ever more crowded video game market, up against companies like Sony, Microsoft, Apple, and Google. When Nintendo first got into the home console business in the 80s, it dominated. But ever since, things have been more complicated. The competitors are obviously Sony and Microsoft. Microsoft goes far beyond gaming. Sony, certainly in this generation, they've dominated with the PS4. And mobile gaming has completely changed the playing field. Nintendo was seen as the king of the handheld market for a very long time, and that market has now been taken over by the mobile games business. The global video game market was worth almost $150 billion in 2019. Mobile gaming made up nearly half of that. You go back to the days where they were really dominant was when they had the DS and Wii platforms and they were dominating in, in both segments. You know, Nintendo was generating operating profit of in excess of 500 billion yen, around $5 billion. And now at the peak of Switch, we're looking somewhere around 350 billion yen, so about three and a half billion dollars. But at the beginning, Nintendo didn't have anything to do with video games. Nintendo spent decades focused on playing cards. Playing cards were a good business until the 1950s, but they also realized if they continue doing playing cards, they will not be able to survive. This may be a trend, things may change. So that's why they started to do toys, that's why they started to go into various other businesses. In 1949, 21-year-old Hiroshi Yamauchi was named Nintendo's new president. He would go on to run the company for more than 50 years. The company went public in 1962. Early on in his tenure, Yamauchi took Nintendo into several new business ventures. The company at one point sold ramen noodles, ran a taxi service, and produced a small toy robot vacuum cleaner. In the 60s and 70s, you would see them with sort of electronic toys, dabbling in electronics. And by the end of the 70s, they had produced a home pong console. And they saw video games as a way forward for the company, a new thing to experiment with. It was a smart move. The market was already huge and had been rapidly growing. In 1979, Nintendo started producing arcade games with names like Sheriff, Space Fever, and then, in 1980, Radar Scope. But Radar Scope was a failure for the just established Nintendo of America. So it was reworked into a new game by a young artist named Shigeru Miyamoto, who would eventually become one of the most famous and beloved figures in all of video game history. That reworked game, released in 1981, was Nintendo's first big hit, Donkey Kong. While this was happening, people were, in general, really excited about video games. Arcades were huge. The Atari 2600 had already come out in 1977. The video game market in the early 1980s had lots of investment, lots of new companies. Everybody and their mother was making video games for the Atari. Everybody goes to arcades and plays arcade games. By 1982, around 100 companies were fighting for a foothold in the industry. That year, arcade games brought in $27 billion. Revenue from consoles was $14 billion. Bally Manufacturing stands to make $100 million selling Pac-Man machines. Then, in the US, the video game crash of 1983 happened. The video game market is very cyclical. There are a lot of boom-bust cycles. The market had become oversaturated as manufacturers focused ever more on quantity, not quality. Everybody and their mother who had an Atari system had at least one or two games they'd bought at that point for 50 bucks, which were awful, unplayable garbage. In 1983, the New York Times reported that demand was up 100% and manufacturers' output was up 175%. At the same time, many consumers were moving from their Ataris and Intellivisions to home computer systems. From 1982 to 1985, revenue from arcade games dropped 66%. Console revenue dropped 93%. 
Atari lost $536 million in 1983. That same year, it dumped 14 truckloads of discarded game cartridges in a New Mexico landfill. It opened up as basically IP and, and everybody started producing very low quality games. And that's what led to the crash of home gaming console business. Despite the market crashing in the US, in 1983, Nintendo released the Family Computer, or Famicom, in Japan. It did well there, but when the company wanted to release a North American version, it had to deal with the market in shambles. A lot of people at the time said, you know, Nintendo, you missed the boat here, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing, but that's also exactly why they succeeded, is because the market was at the perfect point for them to come in and completely take over. So Nintendo reworked the Famicom, gave it a new housing, renamed it the Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, and released it in North America in 1985. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Now you're playing with power. The NES established what is considered the third generation of video game consoles. It was breaking into a market that other companies had been working in for years. The biggest player at the time was Atari, but Atari, like its competitors, had just taken a huge hit. One of Nintendo's first key decisions in the US was marketing the NES as a toy, not a video game. Nintendo was the one who said, we're gonna make this for kids, we're gonna do a heavy marketing push for toys, get it out of electronics, because nobody's buying it in electronics. And in 1986, the system was the hottest toy on the market for Christmas. And in 1987, the same thing happened. Interactive or video games will lead the holiday charge to the cash register. Retailer's overwhelming choice for the season's biggest hit will once again be the Nintendo Entertainment System. They're exciting and challenging. It's fun challenging each other with two-player games. By 1987, Nintendo had taken 65% of the hardware market, and Atari was down to 24%. That's compared to its 80% just a few years prior. The other thing that Nintendo decided to focus on was producing not just systems that worked well, but vitally, good games. If the quality bar could be raised, then the overall market for video games could be broadly expanded. You could start to tell stories, you could do something other than just shoot the aliens and don't die. And it worked really well. The total market at retail in, in 1988 is some $2.3 billion. In a hardware sense, it's uh, probably about eight to eight and a half million pieces of hardware in 1988. And of that, Nintendo has just an excess of 80% of those, uh, those customers. The protagonist in the first version of Donkey Kong was called Jumpman, but in the North American version, he was renamed Mario. Mario. After that came the arcade game Mario Brothers. And then with the NES, and once again designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, Super Mario Brothers. Mario the plumber, unassuming as can be, will be the heir to the mushroom kingdom. I have this very ingrained, deep memory of sitting in my babysitter's basement and playing Mario for the first time and just having my mind absolutely blown. Nintendo from about 86 until about 89 completely dominates the United States home video game market. And they continue to dominate it after 89. It's just that in 1989, Sega shows up with the Sega Genesis. And Sega's entire aura is that they're not Nintendo. They're in your face. They're extreme. Their logo is Sega. And Nintendo is sort of caught off guard by having competition. And with the launch of the Genesis, the console wars as we know them now really start to take off. Genesis done. 16-bit arcade graphics. You can't do this on Nintendo. Genesis done. Sega did manage to take some of the market, but Nintendo would ultimately win that war. In 1989, it released the Game Boy, which did to handheld gaming what the NES did to console gaming. Nintendo had been experimenting with handheld systems since 1980 with its game and watch systems, but the Game Boy took things mainstream. Then the Super Nintendo was released in 1990. So that's the new Super Nintendo Entertainment System. But in 1995, it took a sharp left turn and released the Virtual Boy. Virtual Boy, a 3D game for a 3D world. Wanna play? And it was awful. It really was. There was nothing good about it. It was an attempt to find the fun in the VR way before VR even existed. Certainly a major misstep from Nintendo. But on the other side, it is a testament to their willingness to experiment and to find the fun. 
The following year, Nintendo went back to basics and released the Nintendo 64. The hottest game system in history, and I guess I must be talking about N64! Then in 2000, Sony launched the PlayStation 2, and Nintendo decided that they were going to do the same thing, this time 128-bit the GameCube, but they launched a year late. So Nintendo and Microsoft kind of split up what was left over after Sony dominated. And Nintendo licked their wounds, went back to the drawing board, and decided we're going to do something different. You can see from the period where the N64 launches to that period of GameCube time that they're struggling a little bit. They said that famously, we're going to swim in a blue ocean, not a red ocean. We don't want to be there with all the other sharks competing with one another, we're going to do something different. In 2004, Nintendo released the handheld Nintendo DS, which would become its best-selling device. Then in 2006, it released the Wii. More than a thousand people lined up to get a Wii, and Nintendo officials were proud to report they had enough for everyone. It killed it. They went from being the leader in 85 and 90 to being the laggard in 95 and 2000, to being the leader again in 2006. It was targeting a different set of values than what more mainstream gaming was focused on at the time. I was the first person on the West Coast to get a Wii. There are literally pictures of me in my Mario overalls, like holding a Wii above my head. How long did you wait? I waited since 1991. <laughs> the Wii's hardware was launched after the Xbox and all these other things. It was slower than all of those other things. People were salivating at the mouth for this thing. <laughs> Steven Spielberg was down there at E3 waving it around and everybody's lined up for hours to play with this thing. Why? Because it's fun. Then in 2012, the Wii U was released and it was the biggest commercial failure since the Virtual Boy. The Wii has sold 101 million units. The Wii U sold 13.5 million. In Japan, many companies have a tendency to bring new products to market very quickly. The time production to market is much shorter, so companies develop quickly. If some products fail, that's not such a big problem. The idea is that you can only keep customer interest if you constantly produce new products that are interesting for the consumer. While the Wii U was a commercial failure, some see it as a necessary step toward Nintendo's Switch, released in 2017. The Wii U was a half step. I feel like the Wii U was Nintendo trying to do the Switch before they could do the Switch. And I don't know that it was a mistake. While the Wii U was definitely not a commercial success, I don't know that you would have a Switch without it. Commercially successful and critically praised, the Switch and its games have been seen as a return to form for Nintendo. The company's revenue jumped 116% the year after the console was released. You sold 2.74 million units of your new Switch console in just the first month. Are you going to be able to keep up this pace? We're, we're certainly working hard to. But lately, it hasn't been able to keep up with the pace. Right now, with the global coronavirus pandemic, Switch consoles are suddenly sold out almost everywhere, as gaming overall is up 75% since early March. The Switch is a great console. People will pay $300 plus another 50 just to play Breath of the Wild. And that's how good Nintendo games are. And if they weren't that good, we still would not have Nintendo consoles because Nobody else is making games on Nintendo consoles that anybody really goes too crazy about. Games, along with the consoles they're played on, have always been important to Nintendo. The consistency of their quality is seen as a uniquely Nintendo feature. They're so consistently the best at making certain kinds of games, it makes it inevitable. I guess it's sort of like the Beatles in a way. It's like you reach a certain level and it's like the Beatles are just gonna keep getting passed down to generation and generation and generation and Nintendo's the same way. In an industry where a lot of other video games are now focusing on a very realistic experience, an amazingly graphical, accurate experience, high frame rates, technical specs, Nintendo said, we don't care about any of that, we're focused on fun. They are going down a strategy which is all about complexity, center of the living room. We just wanna bring consumers gaming fun. And those games are where Nintendo makes a lot of its money. They make a little bit of money on the hardware, but 
most of the money is made on the software side and they're not as reliant on third-party software as Sony is. Nintendo is, you know, it's all about their own games. Nintendo has also been famously protective of its intellectual property. With non-Nintendo games, you can often choose what kind of device you want to play it on. Nintendo games can almost always only be played on Nintendo devices. People do not like being locked into the platform that they are playing the game on. Example, you can play Fortnite on, on your phone, on your console, on your PC, you name it, and your progress carries from platform to platform. And people love this. It's, it's like how people use Netflix. If they would take their software and say, anybody who wants to play our software can play it, they would make a lot more money. So what does the future look like for Nintendo? Some see its perceived disinterest in mobile gaming as a misstep and as an obvious next move. They let mobile pass them by and they haven't figured out how to participate in mobile. What we are disappointed mainly is that the company is not showing an intent and the speed when it comes to mobile games. The real unlocking of value happens in mobile game platform. One thing they have that nobody else has is a gigantic library, more than a thousand handheld games. And if they were to emulate Apple Arcade and put a thousand games on it, they would have a hundred million subscribers paying them five bucks a month. It's not reflecting the share price because they haven't monetized it yet. But if you're looking at Nintendo going forward, I think that's the answer. Nintendo has published mobile games in the last few years, like Super Mario Run, but they've always taken a back seat. Avoiding mobile games could be a strategic move for Nintendo, considering what happened when Sega stopped making consoles in the early 2000s. Once it abandoned its own consoles, the Dreamcast being the last of the consoles that Sega developed, and started developing games for other consoles, other platforms, the popularity of those titles it never kind of got repeated on other platforms. You know, I think Nintendo is aware of what happened to Sega and they realize that if they move away from that captured audience and really focus on other platforms, there is a strong possibility that they'll get diluted and kind of lost at sea because there's just so much game content coming out on the mobile platform. There's also the emergence of cloud gaming, like with Google Stadia, Microsoft xCloud, or NVIDIA GeForce Now. Games are going on the cloud. They're gonna be played on the cloud. They're gonna be increasingly hardware agnostic. You know, Nintendo can't afford to ignore cloud gaming. You can see how they're years behind the PlayStation Network, as well as Microsoft's. And now you've got the king of the network, Google coming in. It's gonna be very challenging for them. Just the quality of games alone is unlikely to sway the gamers. If you don't have the quality of network, the robustness of the network gaming that gamers require. And in that case, you gotta ask yourself, where does that leave Nintendo? Another eventuality is that longtime Nintendo employees like Miyamoto will one day age out of the company. When I first started, I always thought I would be young. And now I find that when I come to these types of events and, and get out among the other game developers, somehow I'm the oldest guy in the room. <laughs> People like to say Shigeru Miyamoto is like the Walt Disney of Nintendo. In many ways, like Nintendo is Miyamoto, Miyamoto is Nintendo. They're so interlocked. Whether or not Nintendo can survive without Miyamoto is a bit like asking if Apple can survive without Steve Jobs. It's the same level of importance to the company. So using that as a framework, I would say the answer is yes. Miyamoto has infused so much of his DNA into the company. Miyamoto-san is, you know, obviously he's been a driving force of the gaming business initially for Nintendo, but Nintendo has a very deep bench. Nintendo has a very, very strong development base. I think that some of the talent that they have is once in a generation talent and can never be replaced. So I wonder what happens to a post Shigeru Miyamoto Nintendo. This love for Nintendo and its characters is something that consistently sets it apart from its competition. Mario and Miyamoto have no equal. Typically seen as conservative with what it allows its IP to be used for, Nintendo has been recently exploring new things. There's a Mario Lego set coming out, a Mario animated movie. There's even a Nintendo theme park in development at Universal Studios Japan. I personally looked at that and was like, oh my God, how can I get tickets? How can I get there, please? No offense to Ubisoft, but if they were like, Ubisoft World, I don't know that as many people would be like, ah, 
I need to be there now. With so many successes under its belt and its monumentally impactful characters and other IP, Nintendo is in a position where it can still easily experiment and take risks. As of December 2019, Nintendo had just over $8 billion in cash and deposits alone. Certainly not in the last 31 years that I've been in the market have I seen Nintendo actually struggling for cash. Financially, Nintendo is not a really a company we need to worry about. But it is, of course, a risky business that uh, the expectations are that Nintendo must be an innovative firm forever. And this may be a problem. But uh, in Nintendo's case, we can say that they have very strong and very profitable side businesses that will basically secure survival. 